Okay, hello and welcome to the DICE panel for Digital Tabletop Fest. Um, my name is Nina Collins, I'm the moderator and I work for Oric Digital. I was the producer on the digital version of Ogre and on Acting Cthulhu Tactics. Um, I'm joined by some very exciting people also in the industry. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, starting with Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Jackson. I was guilty of Ogre. That was my first game way back in the 70s. Since then, I have formed my own company, and we did Fantasy Trip and Illuminati and Car Wars and Munchkin and Zombie Dice and a couple of other things. Okay, and also joined by Marlo. Hi, uh, my name is Marlo Doby. I'm an artist and animator for video games, and I did all the art for Dicey Dungeons. And we're also joined by Gian. Uh, hi, I'm Jabola Vernocchi. I co-founded a company called Destiny Bit. We're making a game called Dice Legacy, which is a pretty crazy game with dice. Uh, and uh, I come to you all the way from Italy. Okay, thanks everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, it should be a good talk about dice and all things <laughs> dice related. Um, so my first question, um, for me, my very first memory of dice is snakes and ladders and getting incredibly frustrated because despite it being a completely random game, my brother always used to beat me and I never worked out how, because it's not like you can cheat unless he was moving the wrong amount. Um, I think, oh, have we just been joined by Zach? Yeah, sorry, hold on. Oh, yeah. this. Yeah. No worries, we've literally just started. Um, so yeah, we're joined by Zach now, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, hi. Uh, oh, geez, my mics are not even set up right. Um, <laughs> we can hear you. You're fine. Great. Uh, does, oh boy. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm Zach Gage, and I'm a minute late, <laughs> which is very embarrassing. Um, I'm a game <laughs> designer. I worked on Tharsis um, with Choice Provisions, and uh, otherwise, I do a lot of um, Mostly mobile games. I worked on Ridiculous Fishing, uh, but also Spell Tower, Really Bad Chess, Flip Flop, Solitaire, Good Sudoku, etc. I do a lot of work with um, uh, mostly traditional components in modern game science. Great. Thanks, Zach. And thanks for joining us. Um, we were just chatting about um, so first memories of dice. And, and for me, it was snakes and ladders and getting my backside whooped on my brother. Um, so I'd, I'd like to know what everyone else's first sort of introduction to dice was. So should we start with Marley? Sure. Um, I, th I think my first memory of a dice game was a Pokemon branded Yahtzee. I would play with my brother all the time. <laughs> Maybe second to like backgammon. I have a lot of memories of like rolling the dice in the cups. I always like the look of backgammon, but never understood the rules. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember them. It was a long time ago. Steve, what was your first memory of dice? It would definitely be Monopoly. We played Monopoly in my family, and of course the dice. The dice are everything in Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, Monopoly's banned in my house mostly because of me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, st Jan. I still quite like it. Eh, it's okay. Ish. It's, a uh, game. <laughs> it's 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 a game. Um, my first memory for dice. Um, so I, I guess two comes to mind. Uh, one was uh, uh, stealing my brother's D and D uh, and just seeing this weird shape dice, uh, which mm -hmm. I later found out was twenty sided die. Um, but the first time I actually like rolled die, it was uh, back in Chile. Half of my family is from over there. Uh, just playing with my cousin. Uh, what I believe is a rip off of risk uh called atake i think and you just grab the die and just chuck them and that, that's my first memory of dice <laughs> great and zach what about you uh my first memory of dice is probably parcheesi i don't remember how to play it but i remember playing it a lot um and it had like dice and little cups that you rolled nice is, was that the different colored cups I don't know. It's like a very <laughs> classic, classic like board game um, where you like it's like a roll and move, and I think you can apply 
dice to different pieces or to both. It maybe was like a backgammon sort of inspired game, but um, on like a full size board with all kinds of weird other rules. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we've all got quite varied introductions to to the same thing essentially. Um, okay. So we've been finding dice. Um, from archaeological uh, archaeological digs um, from well over 4,000 years ago. So it seems that they've been around for a long time and, and humans have kept them going and seem to really love them as a form of game. So why do you think that is, um, Steve? Um, they're an elegant solution to the problem of introducing a randomizer to a game. I think, I think we caught on to that one very, very early and haven't come up with anything better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Marlo? Yeah, I think uh, kind of echoing that thought, uh, it's totally just an easy, a really easy way to introduce randomness to games. I think also just like as a physical object, it's really easy to understand. Uh, like pips are pretty much transcendent of language, so it's really easy for anybody to use them. And I think just like the cube is a very easy to understand shape. So like it's something that you can just look at and understand exactly what its function is. And I think that's kind of like helped carry it uh, through all of these years. Yeah, it's a very easy thing to pick up, isn't it? I mean, it's one of the first things that we teach children when it comes to games, throw the dice and see what you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think also the it, it has a particular kind of randomness that's like immediate randomness, which isn't always true of games. So like you could think of cards as like sort of like a a preset randomness, right? When you shuffle a deck of cards, you get the randomness, and then later you play that randomness out. But with dice, the randomness is right there in front of you, and it happens oh, that, in the moment. That's a point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, totally. I agree with everything that has been said. Uh, if I have to come to it from the perspective of the player, especially if you look at like ancient times, I feel like dice are a fascinating little window on fate that you can observe in a limited space, and uh, uh, that you can have some sort of control over it. Like, you know, especially if you think of like 4,000 4, years ago, 2,000 years ago, um, you know, life was very crazy and people had very weird beliefs uh, and also access to information was very different. A die was just something that you threw and you didn't know what was going to come out of it. And so it was like this little window on fate that I think is fascinating. It's like when your stomach kind of jumps before the, the, the role of the die, I think that's a, an invaluable interaction. Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. I've never thought about it like that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, further to that for just a second, we've been thinking that way for a long time. Remember when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, what did he say? Yep. He and said the die is best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think as... As humans, we definitely like to play with that aspect of things, don't we? It's like, you know, some people are adrenaline junkies because they're not totally sure what's going to happen. And I think the, the more faint of heart of us prefer to throw a dice. <laughs> um, great. OK, so um, dice are obviously a huge part of gaming history. They are iconic. There aren't many other pieces um, other than maybe like a chess piece or a playing card that is something that just says games. Um, especially in popular culture. Um, there's also connotations of like gambling though. So how does that play out for a player's expectations when they see dice in a game, do you think, or particularly in your games? Um, Marlo? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for Dicey Dungeon specifically, it's very much like uh, true to the feeling of dice where I think when you see them, and like you said, mentioning like gambling and luck and all that kind of stuff. I think it sort of has this sort of push your luck feeling to it um, where a lot of the way that dice is used in dicey dungeons is rolling and then using whatever number values you get to assign to like attacks or defense or special moves or anything like that. So I think that uh, with dicey dungeons, it's a lot of like roll or re-roll your dice and kind of like push your luck to try and get your most optimal turn. And I think that for me, that kind of just rings true for a lot of games I see with dice where I assume that uh, there is going to be like a luck element involved or some sort of not necessarily like money gambling, but gambling involved in those types of games. Yeah. Okay. Zach? I think... 
This one is a tough one for me to <laughs> take a guess at what people expect. But I found that in general, at least with my group of friends, the gambling nature of dice has sort of like fallen by the wayside a little bit now that people are more used to playing board games, many of which have dice. And that's sort of the first um, experience that, that they expect to have. And I also have found that the way that gambling games tend to implement dice is, is pretty different than... Um, than how most games or most board games implement them. Gambling games tend to use dice as like a sort of um, arbiter of fate where, you know, you put in a lot of uh, dreams and desires and then you roll the dice and they tell you if you if you won or if you didn't. Whereas games, um, modern games and board games tend to use dice in more of like a variety of space way where it's like, if I play a game without dice, I know that I'm going to have to be thinking a lot. I'm going to have to be interacting with people and talking to them and making decisions based off what they're doing. But if I play a game with dice, it's probably a lower key game where I can roll the dice and the dice will tell me what my options are and then I can pick between them. And so the dice are sort of this like selection of, of doors of options and like this uh, sort of availability of space, like the sort of like broad, casual sort of openness. Um, and I think that's become what people tend to expect. Um, and then computer game players are quite different and they have like a often a big allergic reaction to dice unless you're very careful because <laughs> they don't like randomness um, in, in many ways and tend to find randomness to be something that's undermining their ability to think. I think because computer games have so many other ways that you can get randomness and variety into a game, right? You can have like real time elements, you can have hidden randomness. Um, dice are sort of this like randomness that you have to understand and interact with. And, and it gives you this sort of like broader space. Yeah, I can attest to video game players not particularly liking dice. We've had it with, well, we had it with Ogre when we did the digital version, we had feedback from some alpha players saying that the the dice were biased towards one one color or the other, and it's just like oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the same as throwing a dice in real life. It's not possible for it to do that just because it's a computer. <laughs> I've totally experienced the same thing too. Yes, it's interesting how you say that though. I think that uh, it is sort of like this weird aversion to dice because it, they symbolize randomness, but there is so much randomness in video games already that like doesn't get the same kind of like uh the hate as dice sometimes do in digital games yeah yeah i yeah. think sometimes it's possible to like hide it so that with acting cthulhu was different so in ogre obviously because it was a big part of the the physical game we had it shown on the screen um with acting cthulhu we were very much using the dice mechanics but we weren't showing them on the screen so then we didn't have that issue we didn't get that feedback because right. even though that was what was going on behind it wasn't showing up then so <laughs> So yeah. Something I've noticed in general with randomness um, in digital games is that all of those uh, all of those aspects that we were talking about earlier with like um, sort of like belief and fate and like God and dice and like just the universe sort of deciding things for you. When you bring it into a digital realm, instead of associating those things with higher powers, players immediately associate them with the designer's intent. And that's where a lot of this hatred comes from. I can't even tell you how many times people have thought that I was like stacking the deck in a card yes. game, or, like waiting yep. randomness. And it's like, well, in real life, if you rolled the die, you would be like, oh my God, I'm un so unlucky. How is this possibly happening? What's <laughs> going on? And then a video game, you're like, the designer's out to get me. They're trying to make this game harder. It's very, it's very bizarre. <laughs> See, what, what do you think your players' expectations are? Because I, I mean, you use dice in in multiple different ways depending on the game from ogre to to zombie dice that's it's very different well, to you. i'm i'm a dice i'm a dice fan i like dice i have too many of them <laughs> um yet i have uh, bought more the, <laughs> uh, the generation before mine probably saw dice largely as a gambling tool my generation was the first one that really learned them as a gaming tool first and foremost. And I think now people who don't frequent Vegas still see dice as a gaming symbol. Although speaking of symbols, you omitted one, the meeple. That's a symbol of modern gaming. 
Yeah, you're right. It, uh, to our parents, it wouldn't mean anything, yeah. um, but uh, we know what it means. It says this is a game, and, and it might be a euro. <laughs> Although it might not, because as the meeple has become generalized, it, uh, it has been used in games that are in no way, shape, or form Euro, just because it says, Hi, I'm a game, play me. And that's what dice say, too. Yeah. Yeah. Gian, what, what have you found with Dice Legacy? Because obviously it's got, it's got dice in it, but they're quite different to the traditional dice. So how yeah. do you have your players' expectations of what that involves in the game? Um, so I think that compared to, uh, let's say, traditional dice, um, we are using custom dice, which um, at least provide a different kind of uh, experience when it comes to randomness. You know, you do, you're not just looking for the six or the one. You're just looking for a, a result. Uh, and... Um, Dice Legacy, at its core, you know, when I have to explain it to somebody who plays board games, I sort of say it's a worker placement game where your workers are your dice. Uh, and uh, in that fashion, it, it doesn't really matter the results that you get, or rather, there are only little fractions of time where the results that you're actually getting, like, that you're actually seeking the result. Most of the time, you're just adapting to what the, the dice give you, um, which I think is possibly the coolest part of dice. Uh, I think that the biggest difference, which to riff off of what uh, Zach said, is that, like the biggest difference between gambling and what we're doing today is that in gambling, the roll of dice is the last thing. And for us, the roll of dice is the first thing. It's like, here's you roll the dice, and now you find out what you want to do about it. Um, sure, in games like, let's say, civilizations, where dice determine the outcome of a battle, it might be more tricky. Uh, and yes, players will have certain expectations, which I... It's it's hard to come to gripes with because I I I am lying to the player if I am stacking the dice in his favor as well you know which is how let's say civilization solved this problem um, but yeah I much rather just have the player roll the die and deal with it and and see what he comes up with with the tools that he has. Okay, great. Um, so then moving on to um, like scales of randomness in games. Um, so. In games like chess, obviously there's zero randomness. It's not there's, you know, it's, it's all to do with skill. Um, so if you have an unmatched pair, it's, it's not going to go very well. Um, and then so on a scale of that all the way up to um, games that are totally random, like Snake Eyes, like it doesn't matter if you've played it 100 times, first time playing, it's, it's, it's not going to change the outcome. Where are you with randomness um, in your work on games. So things like, how would you find the games respond, the players respond to randomness? So we've, we've already talked about the difference between digital and physical in that sense. Um, and do you think it's, do you think um, random is, is completely random? Uh, uh, is in your games, how important is randomness to the gameplay? Um, so yeah, in general, like on a scale of totally random to totally not random, how do you think that affects the games that you've worked on? Um, Molly? Yeah, um, I think randomness is obviously really important in Dicey Dungeons. Uh, and it does kind of come with the caveat that we talked about where players uh, feel a lot of the times that random is not random, but the game is entirely random with your dice rolls. Uh, but something uh, about Dicey Dungeons that I really like uh, with board games in general, sort of my taste in board games, is having the dice be the random element and then being able to kind of like manage your resources based on those random elements. So, and sort of like what we've all been talking about where the dice roll is the first thing you do in the turn. And then based on those numbers, you are given a variety of different options to sort of like figure out what your most optimal turn is based on that dice roll. Um, and I think that that kind of like good resource management brain feeling is something I really enjoy in board games. And I really enjoy uh, playing that in dicey dungeons and sort of like, the randomness is there, but there's also just what you do with that randomness is the most important part of the game, I think. Well, the way you explain that makes me want to play. So, <laughs> good. <laughs> and Steve, what about your games? Um, I like randomness, but when I use it, I like to put in so much 
that the odds even out over time. Uh, let's give a counterexample first so you see what I mean. In Munchkin, the die may only be rolled a half dozen times during the game, and it's used primarily to run away. And you could have a game where most of the runaways succeed or most of them fail just randomly. And if that were a more important event in the game, I think it would be bad. But zombie dice is all dice rolling. That's all that happens. You roll the dice and you decide what to do. And Ogre, you will, once you are engaged with the enemy, you will make a number of die rolls every turn. They average out. So the randomness is not what happens in general as much as it is what specifically happens. Do you get lucky when you fire on the weapons? Do you get lucky when you fire on the armor? Uh, do you get lucky when you fire on the movement? Uh, the, uh, the result of each die roll should inform what you choose to do with your next die roll. So, so long answer short, dice are best when you use them a lot. Okay. Cool. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, with uh, Dice Legacy, uh, the first question that we always got from people uh, after they saw the, the game was, yeah, but what about all the randomness? Uh, and uh, to which I was responding, um, we can always add more uh, because <laughs> we, we, embraced, we really embraced the roguelike aspects of the game. So not only you roll the dice, but the map is random and uh, uh, certain things that you get are random. Uh, certain events that happen might be random and stuff like that. So we really embraced it full on, you know. Uh, and so we went in that direction for Dice Legacy. But for the next game, uh, I don't know. And for our previous game, our previous game almost had no randomness at all. Um, there is, you know, a time and a place for everything. But what I really like about randomness is that it adds some spice to the game that uh, just a deterministic game can't. Uh, you know, uh, our games at Destiny Bit are all about generating stories for the players. And uh, if you can always go into a game uh, and uh, replicate the same strategy and always get the same result, you will never get a very high high and a very low low. You're always going to be, you know, there in the middle. But with dice or with randomness, you never really know. And so the story that you go tell your friends is about that 95% chance of hitting in XCOM that missed and vice versa, right? So I think that's what makes randomness beautiful. Uh, but it's not for everybody, I guess. Okay. Um, I, I love randomness. I was pretty mixed on it early on in my career. My like first few games, I didn't use a lot of randomness. And then a friend of mine had a, a bachelor party in Atlantic City, and I was forced to spend like 24 hours in a casino. And I totally <laughs> fell in love with uh, randomness and with this game called three card poker which has like one decision in it and that decision is barely a decision like it's mostly random but it feels so impactful to make that decision and see the results of that decision um, and then come up with a story in your head as to like oh I shouldn't have done that because then this happened even though the thing that happened was random um, and that really turned me around a lot on randomness and I've fallen really in love with it I use it in a lot of different ways um, usually it's uh, a bit in advance, uh, randomness, um, in terms of like, uh, not tell, not using dice to tell you what the result is. Although sometimes, uh, you do that, especially in Tharsis, we have a lot of like, uh, dice that you roll and then they tell you what happened. Um, but I guess one easy example of randomness is I made a game called Really Bad Chess, which is basically I was frustrated with the intense fairness of chess and how <laughs> you basically can't have fun playing chess against somebody who's better than you or worse than you. Like you only can learn chess against people who are the same level because otherwise you're definitely going to lose or definitely going to win. <laughs> Um, and so I built this game where the chess board, the pieces that you have are totally random. They're still the normal chess pieces, but you might have like three queens and nine pawns and your opponent might have all knights. Um, and then you play chess. 
Um, and it turns out that chess is really fun like that. And uh, you can sort of balance the material against the other person's material. And so like, if I'm not good at chess, you give me a little bit better stuff and you a little bit worse stuff. But because of the complexity and like where those pieces start and what that means, it's very hard to, even for a pro to judge the quality of a chess board. You can't just add up the pieces to see who's got more because it turns out like if my knight starts in this particular spot, then that's actually a huge advantage for me, even though you might have more of something. Um, and I think that general sort of uh, emergent complexity of systems and dice is what makes them work well together or systems and randomness in general. It's like a way to sort of like cut short the, the, the decision horizon or cut short someone's ability to like think into the future and understand what the game is going to bring them or how they could strategize on their turn versus other people. And I really like randomness in that way because it makes games more relaxing to play, I think, for people who are willing and excited to engage with the randomness because you're letting the system do some of the work and take some of the pressure off of you to be a high skill player all the time or to be thinking all the time. Um, sometimes it's fun to just uh, go on go on a ride and, and see what happens. Um, and I think that's also true of uh, the, the other way that I think randomness is interesting is I think most games are fun um, when you're when you're at like sort of an 80 percent skill level. When you're really bad at a game, you're just trying to learn it. And when you're really good at a game, you're just trying to perform. But when you're in the middle and you're learning and performing and those things are going back and forth, that's where, at least to me, games are the most exciting and the most dynamic. And there are not a lot of ways to keep the player at an 80% skill level. You can change up the components of a game with like literally what the options are. You can change up the layout of a game and like where the puzzle pieces fit, or you can give somebody a random result in terms of what could happen. Um, that's pretty much the, the area that's out there. And so I think randomness fits into a lot of those things. And it's a really good tool to keep people at the, what I think is the most interesting and exciting point of playing the game. Yeah. And I think also just like piggybacking off of that one thing, I don't know if any of us spoke about, but it's probably true for all of our games is that randomness, uh, invites replayability as well. So if yeah. you're keeping it at that 80% skill level, it's like, you're always going to have that 20% randomness that who knows what kind of challenge is going to get thrown at you by the randomness. And I think that's why people like games with dice and like board games and like randomness a lot, because uh, you're going to get, uh, so to speak, a lot more bang for your buck with those types of games, because you'll be able to have a different experience almost every time that you play them. Okay, yeah. that's good. Great. Um, so we've, we've touched on this a little bit already, but it seems that uh, Dice are a really convenient sort of real world bit of UI um, that definitely says to the player, this is going to be random or there is going to be a random element to this game. Um, with modern technology and, you know, apps on phones and things, it doesn't seem like people are moving away from that. You know, you, you'd think that most people would have a, a dice app on their phone, but they don't. It seems like people really like to have the physical dice. Um, why do you think that is, uh, Zach? Oh, I mean, I think the biggest thing about physical dice is that um, you can feel them and you know that they're random and that you know that the, that that chance is in the hands of science or God or whatever you believe in. And you can um, a, a, attach that belief when you roll the dice. And there's a whole culture around believing that certain dice that you have are lucky or not lucky, that certain ways that you hold them or throw them are important. Um, I think people like things that they can hold and and that's like always been a, a big struggle with um with digital stuff yeah Gian, you, you talked a little bit about this earlier when you showed us your your nice new green dice yeah i have a collection of dice as well probably not as impressive as steve's but i'm trying my best <laughs> um uh, so stop. well I'm, i have a long way to go um <laughs> So for physical dice, yes, uh, what Zach said is absolutely true. Um, I think they're beautiful to hold. They're beautiful to throw. They make uh, very funny noises. Uh, there's a lot of about these experiences of board games and why people are attracted to board games that is uh, unmatchable by any video game ever, I think. Uh, it's, just, it's just too good. Um, I think when they appear in video games, uh, it's mostly for two reasons. Either because your game is really trying to 
um, invoke that same aspect, that same uh, aura of board games, that same you know way of interacting with the game that board games, or uh, because the game is trying but maybe not succeeding necessarily to uh, present some honesty uh, on the die rolls. You know, we spoke before about all the die rolls that are absolutely hidden from the player. Um, you know, the stuff in XCOM or whatever. So oftentimes when a die appears in a game, it's just to be like, okay, this is why you failed. You know, we rolled the one, sorry. Um, so okay. I think there okay. are these so, two aspects. So to interrupt, to interrupt, you're saying that the die is symbolic of fair randomness. I'm, I'm, I, what I said is, I don't think it's necessarily a success in uh, being fair, but mm -hmm. it it's sort of like a symbol of fair randomness because it's it's right. not happening behind a curtain. It's something that you can see and perceive. Yes, you can right. still, you know, be like, oh no, that's totally that's totally stacked against me by the designer. But just seeing the die just makes a little connection to the randomness of the game that otherwise would be completely hidden. At least that's my mm -hmm. feeling. No, yeah. that that makes sense. Yeah, that was something we tried to do in, in Tharsis as well. That was uh, um, one of the big reasons why I wanted to have Dice in it was to connect that kind of honesty of like, here's a here's the randomness that you've expected to just be like in a text string or like behind the scenes. And instead, we're going to just present it to you so that we can um, use that honesty to, to, to tell a different kind of um, story, basically. Great. And Steve, what about you with your vast collection of physical dice? What do you think the attraction is? Um, they're pleasing to the senses. Um, they look nice. They feel nice in your hand. They make, uh, they make a, a not offensive sound that we have <laughs> learned to associate with rolling dice and having fun. The, the computer games that to that display dice often include an animation and even a little dice rattle sound uh, to, I think, to more fully invoke the symbolic value of the die that they're demonstrating or displaying, uh, which after all is just, it's a number on a screen. But by adding these appeals to the other senses, um, they're, they're playing up the die as a symbol of fair randomness. Um, I remember a, I think it was the Fighting Fantasy series by my namesake, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone, used uh, images of dice at the bottoms of pages so people could make a die roll by choosing, uh, flipping, flipping through the book and, and trying to choose a random page. And they could have just put numbers on there, but they chose to illustrate dice just to keep people in the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. It's, it's, not, it's not even necessarily just the physical, is it? It's, you can still have a physical representation of it, and it kind of invokes the same things. Um, Marlo, have you ever thought about doing kind of physical little versions of the Dicey Dungeons characters? Um. Uh, yeah, definitely. Like, I think we were talking about this before we got on the panel too, but everyone just was like wanting to make custom dice sets for our <laughs> games. Um, I think adding to a lot of what people are saying too, like we spoke about it kind of at the beginning of the panel too, but dice are such an icon that are introduced to us very early on. So like all of us have very early memories of dice. And I think that probably... I mean, this might be a stretch, but like most people understand what a die is and how it works and everything. So when we're using it in games, it takes no explanation to a player to explain to them like, oh, this is randomly generating a number. It's kind of just become shorthand for random number generation that players can understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also like, at least for Dicey Dungeons and I think a lot of games that video games that are based around dice, uh, it kind of like, draws upon that inherent physicality of dice a lot. So it's nice to sort of get that tactile feeling in games that is really hard to achieve otherwise by kind of referencing something that you understand in real space in real life. Um, yeah, so like for us, it was really cool to be able to like focus on the actual physical dragging of the dice across the screen. So it would feel like you were placing dice on top of things. And I think that lended a really nice physicality to the game that otherwise 
wouldn't have been there if people don't come into the game understanding what dice are. Yeah, nice. Um, so Steve, looking at you particularly with you know so many of your works having dice being used in, in many different ways, in Ogre, dice are particularly key and they're kind of used in a, in a slightly more unusual way than your standard, just roll the dice, see what you get. Um, but you take that further and it seems that layering the roles um, seems to affect the probability to give a player a, strength, a, a sense of strategy alongside the randomness. Um, so for example, um, there was a video in the Ogre Kickstarter where it clearly laid out the process, I think it's about eight, eight or nine minutes in. Um, how did that come about? How did you develop that system of having the randomness and the strategy sort of squished together? Um, to a certain extent, it was intentional. Some of it was emergent. Uh, some of it was learning to play the game better during playtesting and realizing that, as you say, you're, you're layering. Uh, you just every, every single decision on picking a target and rolling the dice and rolling the dice how. Every single decision is uh, based on the one before. Uh, you sometimes change objectives in the middle of a stream of die rolls when you realize that you're not going to get what you had hoped for at the beginning of the turn. And uh, the best result you can get now isn't a subset of what you were going for, it's something entirely different. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that came out during playtest. Uh, I, I would be interested to know whether the other designers here also learned that sometimes you learn to play a game much better after you write it, after you see how the pieces are fitting together. That's me. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that was true for us uh, as well. I think that um, when I came in on uh, the Dicey Dungeons project, it was like a really strong like prototype and proof of concept and everything. But like as we were developing it more and more, like it just became clear sort of like what type of uh, equipment would really suit this game. and those led to other ideas and all that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of a lot of the design decisions for our game really did come out of playtesting and sort of uh, what you said, sort of getting better at the game as you're playing it and having a better understanding of what would make that specific system fun. Yeah, a lot of the way that I design games, um, although interestingly not Tharsis, um, but I'll talk about that later, uh, is, is around playing them so like i'll have an idea that i think is an interesting like concept and then the first thing i'll do is sit down and play it and make up the rules as i go um to sort of fit the concept and that i think is probably why i, I made so many games with decks of cards um, or dice or traditional tools because it's very hard to do that with a video game but if you have an idea for a weird way of drawing cards then you sit down and you come up with a couple rules to do it and then you can just follow those rules and try to follow the fun and, and see what the game is trying to say would would be an enjoyable experience a lot of times i'll just sit down and be like oh I'll draw these cards and try to, oh, you know what? It'd be cool if, if this worked, if this was a cool strategy for this game. And what, how can I change the rules to sort of focus on, on that cool feeling of this new thing happening? You said follow the fun, and that's a great phrase. <laughs> yeah, I can't. If somebody very smart said that, and I don't remember who it was. But Yeah, what I was uh, thinking while you we were speaking is the idea of a game that designed itself. Um, which uh, was also fairly true for Dice Legacy, especially in the beginning. I think that in the beginning, we just threw it together. We just threw a prototype together. And immediately, things started emerging by themselves. Things like assumptions that we thought were going to work didn't work. For example, in Dice Legacy, everything was a dice in the beginning. Uh, so the resources were dice. Uh, so for example, wood, stone, everything was a die. We quickly found out that that wasn't working. Uh, but the core was, was there. So I think that as long as the game has a very, very strong core, the rest kind of comes by itself, and you will learn about your game as you play it uh, very much. Uh, I, I, for the games that we make, uh, usually I'm, I'm a big fan of designing on the page or designing in my head, mostly because I, 
I, I come from uh, this idea of, oh, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of time. So uh, most of the prototyping, prototyping has to happen in my head. Um, so I try to find the very strong core over here. And then when I put it into working prototype, then it's where you see, okay, then all of this new space of possibility has opened up and maybe these things were not working, but the core is strong. I, I think also with games, you know, there's, you can always go any direction at any time because the system is all made up of a bunch of rules that you came up with. It's not like, um, you know, th there's nothing constraining you except for the, the direction that you've picked and, and what's interesting. And so I find that um, it's, it's very easy to get lost in a game design if you don't have something to follow or you don't have like a, a, a core idea that you want to make work. Yeah. Okay. And then Marlo, so looking at Dicey Dungeons, uh, excuse the pun, but a dice take on a role. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> they have the characters. Um, can you explain what the game is and how the dice are used in that way? Because it's yeah. quite new um, to the dice game. Yeah, so the uh, what we're specifically talking about kind of outside of mechanics is that in Dicey Dungeons, your characters are the dice. Um, and that was, yeah, that was something that was sort of like, already decided on by the time I had come onto the project uh, as the artist, but it was, I was really charmed by this idea of actually playing as the thing that you are using as a mechanic. Um, and I don't really see it that often used. So I was really interested in the idea of like all these different dice all being like pretty much the exact same object, but how as an artist, do I make them visually interesting and distinct from each other? And how does that fit into the world? And it kind of just became this whole thing where like all of the dice kind of as characters fit into these different character archetypes that are really recognizable. So you can tell them apart really easily, but also it has to be this like insane wild kind of like Alice in Wonderland-esque world where there aren't really that many rules. Like you don't play dicey dungeons and worry about why you're a giant dice. Like you're just kind of going with it and you're like, oh, I'm fighting a vacuum cleaner, but we're both rolling dice. And it's just like that kind of whimsy, I think was really fun and lent itself to like the anthropomorphic part of it. I also really like the idea that they would just like, this doesn't really happen in the game, but like you could, you could pretend that they're throwing their own bodies to get the numbers, <laughs> which I also really like. So yeah, I think that was like a really fun take on it. And I really like kind of where we ended up with it. It got a little weird, but I liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting game. I really enjoyed playing it for that reason. Uh, Jan, in, in Dice Legacy, you were using an interesting fusion of dice um, in like a city builder sort of scape. Can you talk us through the game and how dice are used in your game? Sure. So um, Dice Legacy is a survival city builder. Um, kind of like, you know, in the vein of Vanished or uh, Frostpunk, but it's all powered by dice. Uh, and the dice are your people. Dice are not actually people, but they are your people. You know, uh, they, they act basically on the dice themselves. There are various faces that allow you to interact with the world, say, gather resources or build buildings uh, or operate buildings and stuff like that. So on the dice, you will find the verbs. So the world is, um, is a ring world, which is because we're crazy. Uh, and uh, essentially what you're doing is you're placing your dice around, kind of like you would in a worker placement game. Uh, and it's all real time. So you place your die, and then you leave it there for, let's say, 40 seconds, and then the die will come back with some wood. Uh, and the idea for this game came, uh, of all things, out of um, blockchain. <laughs> I don't know how, uh, mm -hmm. but I had this idea of uh, mixing dice together. Like The idea of forging dice together was, was fun to me. Uh, what if I could take this die and forge it with another die and then I could do it all over, like over and over and over again. So I could have this, uh, sort of like genealogy tree of dice that are like the, the grandson die is so powerful anyway. Uh, so that was the idea and that was probably too crazy. Uh, and so I thought, well, um, city builders are working. And so if I had to make a city builder with a die, how would that be? And so, well, I just put a pickaxe on a die. And just put an axe on a die, and and the rest kind of designed itself. Uh, like I said before, we made some changes, like dice where resources. You know, now it's more akin to a traditional board game. You have like resource chits, and you have buildings that you actually place around. There's a there's a grid and stuff like that. But the idea of the game came out of 
came out of forging dice together, which happens to be actually one of the core mechanics of the game. Like we want you to forge dice. So if you want, if you have a peasant die and you have like a, uh, let's say a soldier die, you can force them two together and you will get a new die, which we call construct that has the faces of both the parents, but it's also more powerful and has new traits and stuff like that. Um, so that was the whole idea that powered the game. Um, we, we went through many, many iterations. We initially decided that we did not want to do to have dice as people, uh, because mostly also because Dicey Dungeons did that perfectly, I would say. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, Marlo, you gave me an idea for a cosplay of I, I want to see somebody dressed as a die, it's like a giant die, just throwing himself off of like convention centers. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know how that didn't happen yet, probably because of COVID. So uh, when, when that passes, probably. I'm sure people will just throw themselves uh, on convention centers. <laughs> um, uh, no, but th the rest of the game kind of followed and we embraced the roguelike aspects and we embraced everything else. Uh, and uh, so now it's uh, part traditional. You know, if you played any board games like Agricola, you will find yourself at home, but also part very new because there's not many games with dice out there, you know, at least not on this, with this kind of games. Great, thank you. Um, and then Zach, looking at Tharsis, um, so you've got a really interesting integration as well with dice, which seems to really pop out the idea of um, some randomness in the game. Can you explain how the dice are used in the game and how that came about? Sure. I mean, the, so the dice in Tharsis are used for everything. Um, it's Tharsis is like a space survival game that uh, it's got a lot of inspiration from Pandemic. So basically, the game is on a timer and um, kind of in in reverse of pandemic, instead of trying to solve everything before the game ends, you're trying to just make it to the end of the game. So you know how long you have to last for, and you're trying to keep all of your values basically above zero until you're, you make it to Mars. Um, it's like a Mars disaster adventure. Um, and it's not sci, it's sci-fi, but it's hard sci-fi. So there are no aliens. It's just like trying to deal with all of the problems that could happen on a disastrous space trip. Um, and each character in the game has a bunch of values, but also is made up of dice effectively. So like a character starts out with five dice, and then every turn they lose a die unless you uh, feed them, and then they get all of their dice back. And there are other ways to also sort of recover dice. But basically, the game is about taking these characters, going to places on the ship, and then rolling their dice and applying those dice to solve problems or use special um, mechanical devices that exist in certain rooms or like use the dice to create new scientific advancements or something like that. And so the game is designed around you have a bunch of characters, you send one somewhere, you have them do something, then you send the other one, they do something, and then eventually you're out, and then the game takes a turn where the events cause damage and you, new problems come up. Um, and the idea with it, uh, the original idea for it, for the mechanics of it, came from um, thinking about uh, the stuff that actually, John, you were talking about with Sid Meier's uh, talk a long time ago at GDC, where he was sort of faking randomness. Um, and how, like, if you had a 90% chance to do something and you failed at it, players would get really upset. Um, and the thing that I was thinking about was how weird it is that, like, randomness in games doesn't really work around the edges. If you have, like, a 50% chance to do something in a video game or a 60% chance or a 70% chance, if you succeed or fail, it makes sense to players. But once you get to, like, 90%, people start to get upset. 95%, 99%, you can never fail a 99% roll in a video game, or people are going to be very upset. But if you take a 100-sided die and you say, if you roll a 1, this terrible thing is going to happen in an RPG, and you roll a 1, it's the most exciting thing that's ever happened in your history of RPGs. It's so unlikely, and it's just this amazing moment. Um, and so my thought was maybe if I take these things that are happening under the table in a lot of adventure games and put them on the surface with dice, we can really um, forefront those weird, unlikely moments and have them be like deeply meaningful and also feel honest to the player, feel like something that happened. Um, and I played a lot of dice games that I liked, like zombie dice and like um, liars dice, like a lot of sort of minimal dice games. And I thought, how hard could this be to design a game around dice? Um, and it turns out that it's really hard. I'm used to working with systems like uh, playing cards, which really bring a lot. You don't need to add a lot of rules to playing cards to make it work. 
But with dice, actually, what I ran into is that dice are actually not that random, right? Just one in six options is really not that random. If you just stick with, like, if you decide that, you know, for each number on a die, one thing is going to happen, that game is going to become repetitive extremely quickly, unless you're super clever about it, which is like, really gave me a totally new respect for, for zombie dice and for liars dice, the, like these classic dice games um, that have very few rules, but make it work. Um, and so it ended up with Tharsis that we had to design all kinds of sort of like inter layering systems to make the dice be meaningful with the game. And we wanted to do something very similar to uh, what Steve was talking about, which is I wanted at the beginning of the turn in Tharsis for you to have to make a bunch of decisions and for the roles to be relatively stress-free. Like I'm gonna send my person with three dice. They just, they just need to roll a 10, no problem. Okay, that worked out. Now I'm gonna send my other person here. But at any point in that turn, if something doesn't work out, suddenly your next roll is, okay, well, now I got to send my other person with three dice. I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to use them here. And then that works out. And the next thing doesn't work out. And then suddenly you're like, OK, this guy's only got one die and he has to roll a five or a six or I'm screwed. And the question was, like, how do I build to that so that it feels natural and fair for players instead of this thing that just came out of nowhere and screwed them so that the resulting values on the dice feel like they're setting you up? Or something fair, um, and I think the thing that was most uh, emblematic of our of the approach that we wanted to take with the game is the way that your characters can take damage is if you go into a room and an event um, might say like your character will take a damage if they roll a one, or your character will take damage if they roll a five, and so it messes with your um, attempt to try to go into that room and you're like okay I need to roll a twelve value with three dice, but if I roll any fives, if I roll one, I'm fine. But if I roll two fives, my character's going to die. And so it's this like highly stochastic randomness. And the times when it happens, it's like, OK, now I've lost this character for the whole game. How do I survive three more turns when I just lost this character and my hull is on fire and I don't know what to do? And that was kind of the, the whole structure of what, what we tried to do with Tharsis. OK, yeah, I think my, my favorite bit of Tharsis is the blood, blood dice. Yeah, <laughs> just a bit of a fan of gore, so I quite enjoy, quite enjoy those. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left, so I just really quickly want to go around and just ask, so of, of all the different dice that we've got, obviously we've got 1-4, we've got 1-12, we've got 1-20. What's your favourite dice? Uh, Steve, let's start with you. What is my favourite die? Yeah. Oh... <laughs> I think maybe the 12, just because 12 shows up in so many places, you can do a lot with 12s, and the 12-sider is very pretty. It's the only one with pentagonal faces. Uh, I like it. I used it on Cthulhu dice. I used it again on the Zodiac dice set, which is not out yet, but it's, it's at press. <laughs> Uh, Great. Dodecahedron for the win. <laughs> Zach, what about you? Um, oh, man. I mean, I, I think I really like the, the classic D6 because it is um, it wants you to... It's just such a classic. I feel like if I could make a game with any die that's really good, I'd want it to be with a D6 because it, that it's like a good challenge and it feels... I don't know, like kind of kind of classic. It's my kind of constraints. But maybe my favorite die is the D4 because when I first saw one, I was like, this is a die. Is this a die? How does this <laughs> even work? Like, does this, it seems like it shouldn't be possible, um, but it is. <laughs> yeah. Molly? Um, I'd have to echo that and say I think D4 is my favorite, but it's because whenever I play D and D, I stack all of my dice when it's not my turn, and D4 is always <laughs> at the top. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. And uh, lovely, Jan, what about you? Um, I have to go with a D6. It's just classic. It's just perfect. I love it. Uh, with I have a sweet spot for the D20. Um, possibly because it's one of the first dice I remember seeing in my brother's briefcase of D&D &D first edition. So that was so weird. You know, the same reaction that Zach had to the D4, I had to the D20. It was like, whoa, what is this weird thing? But the D6 <laughs> is unbeatable. Fair enough. Um, so that's us coming to an end. So I just want to thank everyone for watching. Um, so links to all of the games are going to be below if you want to check those out. Which I 
thoroughly recommend that you do. Um, and a huge thank you to, to Steve, to Zach, Marlo and Gian for joining us and talking about all things dice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's been fun. Liked meeting everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>